Uh, welcome to the National Museum of Singapore. Today we have a very interesting uh, talk. This is our <coughs> second uh, talk for the Historia series this year. Uh, for those of you who have been visiting the museum and have been attending these talks, you realize that these talks have been really uh, carefully put together to uh, connect to the National Museum's own collections as well as to the collections which are of view in the gallery. And then today we have a very interesting speaker and he has a very uh, snappy title, a very alliterative, um, A Tale of Promises and Tabbage. Um, Martin Lowe is a research associate at the Lee Hong Shin Natural History Museum. And then he, his research interests encompass a range of topics related to natural history, voyages of scientific discovery, and um, um, zoological nomenclature and bibliography. So he's got a lot of um, interest in the natural history, the world of natural history. He's a researcher and a writer for the upcoming bicentennial exhibition uh, at the Lee Kong Chien Natural History Museum, which I understand is going to open in June. Um, so, thank Martin very much for uh, coming down, and he's very busy. Um, and I hope we uh, just have a couple of house rules. Uh, please do not switch on your Afternoon. Uh, thank you. Sorry, just one minute. Thank you, Vidaya. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to extend thanks to Daniel as well. He's not here today um, for the invitation to speak today. Um, the title is A Tale of Thomases and Tapius. And um, like my friend pointed out yesterday, it's a tale. And um, I like stories. So I, I hope you enjoy stories too, because there are going to be a lot of them. Um, the first story I'm going to tell you is actually what happened 10 years ago, today, to the day. Um, on the International Museum Day 10 years ago, the Raffles Museum of Biodiversity Research um, had an IMD event. It was an open house. It was absolutely inundated with people, and we were not prepared for it. For it. And it actually um, sparked off the entire fundraising and you know new museum project that has led to the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. So it's very interesting, you know, the coincidences that happen in our lives. So yeah, I'll get into the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the earliest natural history that has taken place in Singapore. Um, the the tale um, of this natural history revolves around three Thomases by coincidence. Um, the first three natural historians in Singapore were Thomases. Um, it starts on a day, the date is unrecorded, in June 1819. Um, and this is what Raffles said of that day. Um, the dugong afforded no less interest under the knife than satisfaction on the table, as the flesh proved to be most excellent beef. Our entertainment was truly marine. For we had on the same day discovered those Neptunian sponges which served us as goblets. So apparently they actually use these little sponges as to toast. Um, I can tell you that sponges are not suitable for that. They have lots of spines. So I, we don't know if Raffles was making this up, but th this is published you know, by Raffles. Um, the Neptunian sponges that Raffles refers to um, are a type of marine sponge. And Thomas Hartwig, this is the very first Thomas, he described them. So zoologists and natural historians make a distinction between description, which is to talk about something for the first time, and naming something, which is to actually give it a scientific name. So Tom, uh, Thomas Hartwig actually described and named the Neptune's Cup as Leona Patera. Um, he did this at a meeting on the 13th of November, 1819. This is just a few months after the founding of modern Singapore. So that's what the sponge looks like. This is a specimen that will go on display during our exhibition. 
they do look they do look like goblets. Um, on your right will be is the the very first drawing of this animal by Thomas Hartwig. Then of course the next ref, the next Thomas we have is uh, Raffles. Sorry, the next Thomas we have is Raffles. Um, as mentioned, he collected a dugong on that day in June 1819. It was dissected and he read an account of it um, at the Royal Society on 18th of May 1820. This is the first report of any mammal from um, Singapore. So that is um, the drawing of the dugong from a later paper, um, but it is based on Raffles' specimen. And on your right is a sample of dugong tissue from an animal that died in Pulau Tsekong in 2006. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring the whole animal back, so we kept a piece of tissue and a skull. Okay. The third Thomas is Thomas Horsfield. He wrote uh, Zoological Researches on Java. Um, in Zoological Researches on Java, they, he actually published a plate, a drawing of a bird, and that drawing was published on, on, in July 1822. Um, I count it as half Horsfield and half Raffles because Horsfield gave the genus name, which is Calyptomena, and Raffles gave the species name, which is Viridis, which is green in Latin. Um, so half half. That's the original um, painting from Horsfield. Now we return to Thomas Hardwick. And Thomas Hardwick, we now know, collected a lot of animals from Singapore. Um, one of them, um, was the first fish to be described. I have used first in inverted commas because the f these animals have always existed in Singapore. Um, it is only that they were described for the first time. And the first fish and the first snake were described by John Edward Gray in the illustrations of Indian zoology. The first fish um, is Anacanthus barbatus, and the painting on which it was described was described uh, was printed on 6 January 1830. This is the original painting. It, it's a real fish, okay? And it, it looks like that. This is from Singapore. Um, John Edward Gray also names the first snake, uh, which is now known as Trimerosaurus purpurea maculata, or maculatus, sorry. Um, it's commonly known as the shaw pit wiper. We also know it was collected by Hartwig. And this one was this published on 14 April, 1832. So this is all very, quite early in the history of um, Singapore. That's what the, that's the original painting, and that's a specimen. Um, they are not, the next two are not Thomases, but they are closely connected to Raffles um, and the other two Thomases. So Nathaniel Wallach was a Danish botanist, doctor, who was in charge of the Calcutta Botanical Gardens. And he visited Singapore, made many collections of uh, Singapore plants, which were sent back to England. And from amongst these, uh, J.D. Hooker, I think, which is the man on the right, described the Singapore fern as Tectaria singaporeana in 1827. And that's the original painting and a specimen. So, in addition to these five, six men, on, June, on the day in June 1819, which we take as the first collecting event from Singapore, um, Raffles had with him two Frenchmen, um, we have Daya and Duasel, and he met these two Frenchmen in India, and they, they will be part of the story that comes next, it's a very interesting story. Um, but on that day in June 1819, there were at least three of them in Singapore collecting. Um, we now know that Daya or Duasel made a painting of an animal from Singapore, and it is one of the earliest known paintings that actually has Singapore written on it, um, together with an animal. And that's, unfortunately, I cannot tell you what it is. It will be on display at one of the museums in Singapore later this year. Because I, I'm sorry, I haven't gotten permission to reproduce it. So you can look up for that. It's something to look forward to. That this will be the earliest um, labeled drawing of an animal from Singapore. And just to summarize, because you know sometimes zoologists like to keep track of who has been describing how many species. So Raffles gets uh, five and a half, 
of the first animals, Harvey gets half, Hard, uh, sorry, Horsfield gets half, Harvey gets six. Okay, so that's the earliest, you know, the earliest bits of natural history in Singapore um, from what we call a Linnaean standpoint. That means after Linnaeus, under the, the current framework of uh, zoological or animal nomenclature. And the next theme I want to explore is what, what was unique about Raffles? What was special about Raffles? Was he special? And one of the things that I, I feel um, is an accurate representation of him is that he was a collector of collectors. And this was a fairly common thing um, in that time, during that time. Um, they would hire local collectors or local people to hunt animals, to collect plants. This is very well known. Uh, Munshi Abdullah talks about what Raffles was doing while he was in Singapore, in Indonesia. Um, but what sets Raffles apart um, is that he actually collected non-native, non-local um, collectors. He actually managed to accumulate this group of Western collectors, explorers who came to the East under him or around him, and he would get them to collect for him. So amongst them will be people like Arnold. Arnold was a botanist who was there when the, refle the first Rafflesia was collected. So that's why the Rafflesia is named Rafflesia Arnoldi. Half to Raffles, half to Arnold. Um, there's of course Thomas Horsfeld, the two Frenchmen, Daya and Duvacel. Then there's also another famous uh, botanist, Jack um, and Wallach. And through the two of them, of course, is William Farquhar, or Farquhar who uh, never really got along with Raffles. Almost all of these collectors who Raffles accumulated around him um, led very short lives. All the botanists died before Raffles. Um, only Horsfeld had a very long and productive life. So now we know what Raffles' pattern of, you know, what his, how he did his natural history business. But what were some of the influences or how did, what were some of the ideas about natural history that he had? And I think one of the things that we can see is that he was influenced by um, Joseph Banks, who was a uh, president of the Royal Society. So Joseph Banks is in many ways a person who, the whole, you know, the Charles Darwin uh, ideal of a surgeon naturalist on a ship. Um, Joseph Banks was kind of the first person who started that off uh, when he traveled on the Endeavour, which was uh, captained by James Cook, which is still around the world. And of course, Joseph, Bank, uh, Joseph Banks became a very famous person after he came back to England. And many books have been written about the Endeavour on Joseph Banks. But it is clear that Joseph Banks was in correspondence with Raffles, at least until Joseph Banks died, which was not very long after they started. But it is, it is quite possible that Banks had an influence on Raffles. Um, the picture on the left is a replica of the Endeavour. So Joseph Banks comes into Raffles' network. The next, well, there is a pattern here in the, the accumulating of people around Raffles to help him with his natural history work. And in many ways, there is a mirror of this um, about a century earlier. Um, and this, of course, is Linnaeus. And Linnaeus had his so-called apostles. He actually called them apostles because in his, I, in his mind, he was sending them out into the world to bring back natural history. Linnaeus, as she said that, okay, I'm, I'm quoting. And these are some of his apostles. There were many more than this. Most of them, or quite a number of them, died of all kinds of uh, infectious diseases while they were overseas. So there, there is a pattern. Raffles was in many ways consciously, subconsciously mimicking a pattern. And there is an intriguing link between Linnaeus and Raffles. And that link is Banks. Because Banks was directly um, in connection or in, in communication with uh, Linnaeus. So this gives you a very quick summary of what I think were some of the influences on Raffles um, and the other naturalists and natural historians at the time. And now we go to the part about the tale of the tapir. Um, 
So Fucker and Raffles, of course, never got along. And one of the reasons for them not getting along was because of um, the competition to discover and describe new animals. And it, it actually got pretty ugly. So Fucker sent a paper on the Malayan tapir to the Asiatic researchers in Calcutta. And the let, it's dated 29th January 1816. Raffles heard about this. He um, rings his friend up, Wallik, which we heard about earlier. And he asked Wallik to remove Farker's paper from the upcoming issue and put his own in. So we do not know if Wallik ever replied to Raffles. Um, maybe Wallik felt that he was far away from Raffles enough that he didn't have to bother. But score one for Farker. So Farker's paper comes out in 1820, five years after it was submitted. And he publishes a picture of the uh, woodcut of the tapir and a skull. And this is the first description of the Malayan tapir. And of course, in the Farker Gallery, there are the two tapirs. And it's very clear that there are similarities between them. Okay, so again, first description of the Malayan tapir in English. Because George Cuvier publishes an account and a painting of the tapir in March 1819. So that's a year, about a year before Farker. So how did they scoop um, the English? How did the French scoop the English? Dayat and Duarcel were both closely connected to Cuvier. It was probably not very wise of Raffles to hire them as collectors, but which he did. And we know that Dayat copied Farker's manuscript while he was in, sitting in India and sent them to his uh, former teacher. So that is where Cuvier got his information from. And to make it worse, Frenchman number four, Desmarais, gave the tapir his scientific name. So he basically um, cites Cuvier's account and he gives it a Latin name, which I underlined, and that is recognized as the scientific name for the tapir today. It's still the scientific name that's used. So, okay, so the English lose, the French are in the lead, and then we have the eunuchs, which I promise you in the summary of the talk. So Zheng He was a eunuch sailing as commander of uh, Emperor Yong. Sorry, pardon my Chinese pronunciations, okay? <laughs> I'm really bad at Chinese. He was an uh, admiral in Emperor Yongle's uh, treasure ship fleet, which there is a re replica of it at the Marine Exper Maritime Experiential Museum in Sentosa. So this is a modern modern rendition of what is Zheng He is thought to look like. And these treasure ships were truly amazing. I mean, they are known to have been large enough to actually transport giraffes back from East Africa, like the replica shows. And we know that they came to Southeast Asia. The accounts were written up by mainly by Ma Huan. Ma Huan was a translator for uh, Zheng He. These are published in the Ying, Ying Ya Sheng Lan. And in one of these volumes, Ma Huan talks about the divine stag. He says, in the mountains of this country, a supernatural animal is found called the divine stag. It looks like a large pig and is about three feet high. The fore part of the body is black, the hind part white. The hair is sleek, short, and very fine. The mouth is like that of a pig, but not flat in the front. The hoofs have three grooves and it only eats plants. And of course, to us today, it is very obvious what is this. But it took a long time before anyone figured out what this animal was. And this was this animal, the divine stag, which is Shen Lu, is, was uh, identified by Chu Molin in 1879 in a book. And this is Chu Molin. So that was the Chinese name that he gave himself. So we, we know this is his Chinese name because he stamped it in two of his books. And he was a Dutch translator and linguist working in Indonesia. He had an interest, obviously, in the, the travels of Zheng He and Mahuan. And he first identified the divine stack as the Malayan tapir. But that still leaves the question of how do you jump from divine stack to Malayan tapir? 
in terms of the nomenclature. So we enter another Englishman, this one an administrator. His name is uh, William George Maxwell. And he analyzed the etymology of the name and he came to the conclusion that it is because Mahuan spoke Hainanese. So as you can see from the page where he talks about um, identifying the divine stack, um, Maxwell could actually read and write several languages. You have Jawi at the top, where he because that was how Malay was is rendered, and he writes about the Tanok, and then he writes in Chinese, and then he writes in writes about Hainanese pronunciations. So Maxwell is quite a remarkable person, and he concluded that if you pronounce Tian Lu in Hainanese, you get Tenok or Tinlok some, or some such similar pronunciation. And they were basically transliterating um, what the, name, the local name that they heard for the tapir into Chinese characters that they could write. And that's how you get a divine stack. And Maxwell, of course, provided another example to back up his hypothesis. And this is also for Mahuan. Mahuan uses these two characters, which in Chinese are pronounced as yam, yam pa, or something similar, and he describes it as like a mango-like fruit. And if you pronounce it in Hainanese, you get jambu, or jambu, which is guava in English. So, quite likely that that was the case. And, and so we have basically four centuries of natural history of Singapore and the region. So you go from Tengha to Fakar, Parker's paper, uh, or his, let, his manuscript is dated 1816. The earliest known preface of the Ying Yashenglan is 1416, so it's 400 years. Yeah. So the final, my final theme that I would like to explore is um, what, what is natural history good for then? You know, I mean, I, I enjoy digging up old books, old references, you know, finding old pictures. I just found one this morning, which I'll show you later. So what, what is, but what is it good for? And I, I would like to, like to suggest that, apart from it being fun, for personally, I think when we start looking at the different strands, different traits of stories that have taken place over the years, which is history, we, and we follow them backwards in time, we realize that they start to interconnect, interweave, and you never know, you never really know where you might end up. But when you, as you see the interconnections and how they interweave, you realize that they are part of a larger story. And if you go, of course, if you go far back enough, if you look from far back enough, what we call big picture history, you actually see big themes, big patterns taking place. But if, if you go back and you zoom in, you realize that these strands, these stories, as they interweave, they actually make up the tapestry. They make up a, a painting or a picture. And, and I, I think it, this is one of those things that's very hard to, to sell to uh, people you want to ask for grant money. But you know, but you, you never know where you're going to get or you never know where you might end up. Um, but but I, I think there is much fruitful research to be had by, by digging for, for older and older first as I have phrased it here. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, I have known about this question for a while, but I only managed to find, to put one more piece into the puzzle today, this very morning actually. Um, William Marsden wrote the history of Sumatra. So his first edition is from 18, uh, 1783, and he listed, just in words, the Kuda Ae, which Kuda Ae, of course, is water horse, and he translated that into hippopotamus, which is river horse in Greek. And when his book came out, Kuve was, of course, puzzled by what Marsden said, because as far as Kuve knew, the hippopotamus is only found in Africa. So Kuve wrote a very, not very nice reviews about Marsden's work, saying that Marsden, you know, is, is making up stories. He couldn't possibly have seen a hippopotamus. Um, 
But some some more recent researchers think that Marsden was actually talking about the tapir um, when he said what uh, water horse. And Marsden says that his information came from a person called Wolfelt, who had a drawing of it, which I would really like to see if any of you know where it is. So it's something I'm looking for. But Wolfelt actually drew this animal from Sumatra when he was serving the coast of Sumatra. And this was where Marsden found the information. Marsden, in his third edition of 1811, uh, gives a more um, extended description of the water horse. And it, it is fairly clear that it is the tapir. So that would make, in the European language at least, Marsden's one of the oldest or the oldest. At that time, um, Cuvier said of Marsden's work that he was he basically confused the hippopotamus. And strangely, Cuvier said that he confused the hippopotamus with a creature known as the Sukotairo that was published in a book by Neuhoff or Neuhoff. And just this morning, I was digging around because I had some time. I managed to find Neuhoff's book online. And I have a picture of the Sukotairo. And here it is. So, Marsden, sorry, um, Neuhoff says that the name came to him from the Chinese. So that's another, that's another strange, puzzling question there. And this is, this is my last slide. So I do not have an answer for you. It is something that I would like to find out. And maybe in the, in the months to come, there will be an answer to it. Um, I was just running by this name this morning because Neuhoff said that it came from Chinese. So I was running it by my colleague who is quite good at Chinese matters. And the only thing that he could come up with was that possibly the Neuhoff could have asked a local Chinese what this animal was. And his reply was, uh, 是 he basically said it was it's a very big cow, and basically that somehow ended up as super tyro. Yeah, that, that is the only thing we could come up with at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so I hope you have enjoyed this, this tale or these tales. And yeah, thank you. I know it's a bit short, so you have more time to ask questions. I'm more than happy. Okay. Sorry, we did the next slide. Okay. Sure. I think she has a. You want to wait for the mic? So, okay. Yes. Yes. Ah, sorry. Yes. So this image is from, no, this is a very recent 1900 book. A very recent 1900 book. Yeah. But the, the name Kuda I is still being used even at that time for the tapir. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to mention about that. Yeah. This is from, I think, J.G. G. Wood's um, Natural History, I think, 1900. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I want to ask, um, can you see the Singapore turkey? Singapore turkey? Ah, sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yes, it's still found in Singapore. Yes, it's, it's not particularly endangered or anything. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but the green, the green broad bill, the green broadbill is extinct from Singapore, um, or extinct in Singapore. It's, found, it's still found in other Southeast Asian countries, but it's extinct from Singapore. Um, this one is still fairly common, as is the snake. Yeah, just the, the broadbill. Even, the, even durungs are still fairly abundant in the sense that we, we see feeding trails in the seagrass meadows around Singapore. You don't actually see the animals, but you see the, the what's left after they feed. Yeah. Yes. 
analysis of the original word and all the different languages. When was that? 1909. Yeah. I actually wanted to talk, or oh, let me just show you this stamp, which I put in here as kind of like a, so the stamp on the right actually shows a little tape here. Um, and by coincidence, the British North Borneo issued that stamp in 1909. So it kind of like commemorates Maxwell's paper. But the stamp itself is an enigma because the Malayan tapir is not known from Borneo in recent times. It is known as fossils, but not as a living animal. So why they would have put that on their stem is another interesting question. Yeah. Yes. Um, the dugong is about this, like this, when I'm horizontal. Yeah, it's a bit more than that. Um, Raffles actually said that his was eight feet. Yeah, eight feet. So, two more feet. Yeah. We have one in the museum if you want to come and visit. I mean, a skeleton. Oh, sorry, the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, Raffles collected collectors. Yes. And most of his collectors were European. So, was that any other Oh, no, no. So, um, what I was trying to say is that Raffles was not unique in um, hiring local people to collect for him. Because every, almost everyone was doing that. They would pay locals to collect shells and animals, monkeys for pets, birds. That was, that was not a normal thing to do. What was abnormal about Raffles was that he would actually pay Europeans to collect for him. Yeah, because, I mean, there were lots of explorers coming to this region during that time um, from Europe, but Raffles was unique in paying those explorers to collect for him. Yeah. Um, I think there might, I'm not sure about that. Besides the tape here, there might have been one or two others. I can't remember offhand. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Do you think the first time I'm learning that Rebel from such a person interested in natural history? Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you really think of him when like, someone who came here for the economy developed in Singapore? So, what was his um, like, education of his work? Was it, uh, was it more of a sideline kind of thing? Or... Um, so, let me give you two quotes. One is from Raffles. Raffles himself said towards the end when he kind of got sidelined in Singapore's you know, politics that um, he has, in, he, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said he has enough of politics, he has enough of humans, but at least he has his animals, at least he has nature. So I think that that's very telling. I think the other quote is from Nigel Bali, um, the sword. Nigel Bali has a book from 1999 on Raffles. I can't remember, sorry, the golden sword or something. And the, Nigel Bali actually says that the way to understand Raffles's collecting, not just of natural history, but all his ethnographic cultural material, is through his natural history. So by looking at what Raffles collected in, in terms of natural history, it actually informs his way of thinking, what was going through his mind. To answer your question directly, um, as an administrator, I think they would have had some time but I think most of it would have been done by people he was paying to do. Yeah. So Munshi Abdullah has an extensive account of that. Hmm. And the recent book that was published by the ACM for their Revisiting Raffles exhibition mentioned, uh, talks about a possible you know, like scene of what he, how his natural history activities were taking place. Yeah. That's, that, because it's like almost imagining like someone like the PM mm. or oh, yes. inviting yes. the people about the biological findings in Singapore. So it's something quite... Well, I, I, think, I think because of the world we live in now, we have a lot less time to devote to other things. But in the past, people have always had other interests. People have been... have, have had a wider breadth of 
activities in their daily lives. Um, the reason the emperor who recently abdicated Akihito, he's a marine biologist. He has actually described several fish, um, some even from Singapore. Um, so I, I think I think we have just come to a point where we have become so focused, or we, we believe that being focused on one thing is the best outcome. Yeah, but in the past, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any other administrator or, or politicians who also indulged in in natural history. I can think of a lot of diplomats. Yeah, um, but I, I think we have become more narrow in our our lives. Yeah, and our interests. Yeah. In the uh, hiring of the European mm -hmm. to do the production of him, right? What's the main reason of him doing that as opposed to him doing the focus? Is it anything to do with like culturally superiority? Um, maybe a bit of that. I mean, I I don't know. I I'm I'm not. I I can't answer that in terms. Of the, I can't answer the cultural superiority part, but. I think if you go up to the gallery where Farkas paintings are, and if you can get hold of several books that have been written on the collection, I think the most recent one was with John Bastin and EDM, they actually talk about the, the way that the paintings were made. And a lot of these paintings were actually done by Chinese artists and local artists. And you can tell that if you compare them to what we would consider to be zoological drawings, there is a big gap. Um, like if we look at if we look at the drawing by that is published in Cuvier, so that is a fairly anatomically correct tapir, but if you compare it to this, you see that there is a difference, and I think it is it is not about cultural superiority but about the way the training took place, the way the milieu in which they have been sitting in. So, of course, we cannot deny that the zoological framework that we are using, even to today, is a European concept. A Linnaean taxonomy and nomenclature is a European concept. And, but because they were being trained in it, at the center of it, the way they perceive the world is very different. I, I once asked my father this question. Um, why is it that, you know, before Da Vinci, people could draw humans, right? But they didn't, they looked wrong. But when Da Vinci came along, suddenly, you know, you could have anatomically correct drawings. And, and it's, it's not as simple as what you see, but also the way you think and you perceive. And of course, with the enlightenment came things like, you know, people are actually dissecting cadavers and bodies. And once you start doing that, you actually realize that what you see on the skin actually has a deeper basis to it. So it, it is not as simple as, you know, I mean, or, yeah, it's, it's a very complex issue. But I, I think because Raffles hired Europeans to do this, things were different. Yeah, I think because of that, the drawings that came out of that, not, not this one, um, the drawings that came out of it, the way collecting was done, the way the animals were preserved, for example, you know, there, there would have been differences. Yeah. This, that, that's a, your question? Okay. Yes. Um I don't know. I mean back in the day they could have been waiting for for more papers or to have enough papers so that they could publish it to make it economically worth worthwhile. Um so the sponge, Hardwick sponge paper was from what I can remember. Um, so I mentioned it was read in November, right? So it was read before the Society in November 1819. It was sent to the same journal, the Asiatic re, uh, Researchers. It actually came out in 1822. So it still took four years. Yeah. So maybe Asiatic Researchers was slow. Because what happened actually is um, the description of the sponge, which was read at the meeting, was actually published in two other places a year later because these were like monthly newspaper-like things and they actually published the minutes of the meeting. So the first description of the sponge that's published actually is, dates to those two little publications, but the one with the painting and with the full description only came out 
three years later. Yeah. Even today, things can take a while to get published. I mean, it does happen. Yeah. Ma, okay. That, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question because so almost all old papers and a few of those, even today, I think some of the, the more, what we call them, the more traditional English societies would actually still, if you download their journal article, it would actually still say who communicated the article. So they, they would still have meetings. They would still read aloud what their findings were. And then later on, they would be published in the journal. And, and yes, they, they, did, they would actually bring specimens to the meeting, um, talk about the specimen. So very often, we actually do not know what took place during the meeting. So the only thing that we know of is actually the published paper. So all kinds of things could have happened during the meeting. Yeah. Um, on a more local note, there was a Singapore Natural History Society um, that was founded in 1921. Um, the last known meeting was 1930, so it's only about a decade. They actually would bring things to show at the meetings. Um, for example, one of them was uh, orangutan nest. So there was kept, there were captive orangutans in Singapore, and orangutans built nests out of leaves to sleep in every night. So they, there's actually a picture in the Singapore Naturalist, and it actually shows a branch with the nest. And I think the photograph was taken outside this very building. Yeah. And so they would actually do things like that at the meeting. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, was it common for other naturalists to steal naturalist papers? <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Um, I'm trying to think of who else this has happened to. I cannot remember off the top of my head, but I, I, this, this has, there is a feeling it has happened. Um, yeah, off the top of, I'm sorry, but if you, I, I, if you want more, if you want examples, you can contact me. I, I can dig them out. Yeah, but I can tell you, a, since we're taught, telling stories today, I can tell you a very interesting story about somebody who thought his research got stolen. So, the world's expert on sharks was sitting on, the, on describing, uh, you know, that if, if you heard of the mega mouth, so it's a species of shark, um, and he had specimens with him, but he was just so busy with all his administrative work, he, and he, he just sat on the dis describing it, so he never published it, and he had two students under him, and they, they kind of got fed up asking him to describe it, so one day they made a fake article in Japanese so that no one would be able to understand it. So they basically took bits of articles from all over and made a fake description of the, the shark and they showed it to their supervisor. And he, of course, he blew his top and he was really angry. But when he settled down, they told him that it was a prank, but that if he was not careful, it's gonna happen. So he described it, yeah. Yes. Um, I think from Marsden's 1811 description, yeah, it isn't. I think because, so Marsden actually talks, uh, okay, I haven't been able to dig up all the strands yet, as you have seen, I just managed to find that this morning. But um, Marsden in 1811 makes it quite clear, and I have... I don't know where this other author got his information from, but he quotes Wolfell, whom Marsden also quotes, as saying that it was a two-toned rhinoceros. Yeah, so it's more than likely that it is not a rhinoceros. Yeah. Marsden, Marsden's account is actually quite interesting. Um, I think one of the, the problems, in a way, that Singapore natural history will need to deal with is that all of this information is in things that do not have Singapore in the title. So, history of Sumatra, zoological researchers in Java. 
Singaporean natural historians will actually need to widen their scope substantially, read through all these old books which are not always interesting or easy to get. And I, I think then we will have a, a, a good natural history. But it, it's still very much a work in progress. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, in terms of searching for the first mentions of a certain um, animal or um, plant or things like that, do you ever look at more what would be considered um, mythological texts? For example, um, many animals where everything is not all written and mm. uh, a history of the genealogy of um, kings and things like that, where um personally the f the tapir is the first one I come across um my interest has not so much been in in actually finding these first mentions per se i it's been more my interests have been more um oblique and then i end up i have ended up at this point but definitely i think we like I was saying, we need to expand the scope. I mean, if you look at Mahuan's description, right? He starts with a divine, he's, no, he says, what? Supernatural animal. And I think any person working in any of our universities today, the moment they see supernatural, they're just, they're just going to drop it and move on, right? I mean, you, what is your professor going to say? Um, but I, I think it would, it would definitely benefit natural history if people would actually take an interest in all these, but also have the ability, like Maxwell, to be able to read several languages and to actually start digging around. So to actually look at, for example, the Malay Annals and to not go in with the preconceived notion that you know, they, they were just either making things up or they're not being very serious. Because I think Mahuan is a very good example that they were being very serious. They were really talking, they really saw what they're talking about. I mean, of course, of course there, there, there is myth, but very often they actually saw what they were talking about. And to not go in with the idea that, you know, we, we can discount all these things. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Oh. <laughs> so, um, on to bring home the bacon, I actually do things like assemble species checklists with my boss. So basically, you want to find out like how many species of crab there are in the world. And we basically look for, he has a checklist of course, but you have to look for all these old descriptions. Is it, could this be another crab? What, what is the identity of this name? And we work from there. So I assemble, help him assemble the list. I help him assemble the bibliographies to go with the list. Um, so that this list, because they are clean and validated, they can be used for other data-intensive uh, research, like biogeography. Um, that's one thing I do. Um, I also enjoy zoological nomenclature. So that is how animals are named. And it's actually surprising that the number of animals that have been described twice by different people is actually quite common. Um, when that happens, you end up with two names or more than two names for one species, which is a bad state of affairs. And you need to decide who published first in order to decide what name you should use. So I also enjoy like, figuring out which was published first. So if you have two names, both published in the same year, which book came out first? Yeah, that, I like doing things like that. Yeah, so that's that. Most of this that you have heard about today actually came about as res from research I'm doing for our upcoming Bicentennial exhibition. So I would invite you or, you know, just tell you that there will be an exhibition in June and it will actually talk about the 200 or so, or more than 200 years of natural history in Singapore. And that's where most of this came from. Yeah. Sorry, you. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, later this year? Yeah, this year, but later. Yeah. I can't give you a date, otherwise it will be, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Is so different. You have Latin, you have non-English, different people, like you have the uh, uh, tablets, indicus, which is not a reference to the teaching, mm. and then you have the other one with the chocolate, the green, the green one. So, was there no uh, specified format? This is called the Latin. Mm. No, there, there still isn't. So, the best, the best rules for nomenclature are the least invasive, because you do not want People need to describe names in order to be able to apply them to species, right? And you do not want to be intrusive because it makes, gives everyone more work to do. So the current rules of nomenclature are actually quite simple. They basically tell you what you shouldn't do. Like gen the, the, the whole idea that you can't name something after you, by the way, is not in the, in the code. You are allowed to, but it's bad form. Um, so nobody does it. Um, but they tell you basically how to form names, and that's about it. Yeah. So basically, you can use any name you want for the genus and for a species within reason. They recommend you don't use names that are too long or names that cause offense. And if you do use a name that causes offense, um, you, the commission that uh, administers the code can actually strike off your name. Yeah. But generally, it's not done. Yeah. Because it just makes life more tedious than it already is. Yeah, but yes, but it also makes for a very nice uh, variety in names. So there are names, there is a fly with a really big abdomen named after Beyonce, I think. You know, so yeah, you know, natural historians can have fun too, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs>